Hey everybody, so today we're going to be covering chapter 34, covering chest trauma. In this chapter we'll review the an anatomy of the chest, some categories of chest trauma as well as specific injuries that you'll see located to the chest, um, as well as how to assess and treat uh, chest injuries. The issue that you will have when dealing with any kind of chest injury is a lot of them are going to be lethal. And they're not going to have a dramatic appearance as like how you would in other areas because sometimes the external portion of the body where you can physically see it may not be obvious. So you always want to take into consideration mechanism of injury when determining whether or not a possible chest injury is present. Now your chest is a hollow area. Within that, the middle of the th thoracic cavity lies the mediastinum. This is where your heart is. Okay. On either side of the heart is where your right and left lungs is. Your mediastinum also houses your trachea, the vena cava, your or aorta, esophagus, and the heart. Your visceral pleura is the innermost layer and is in constant contact with the lung. Your parietal pleura is the outermost layer of your thoracic cavity and is in contact with the thoracic wall. These two layers are separated by serous fluid, which provides lubrication to reduce friction between them. Now, as you can see, here's your mediastinum right in between the lungs. Now, the, the rectangular portion of the anterior chest is framed by the clavicle superiorly, midclavicular lines laterally, and coastal margin inferiorly is referred to as the cardiac box. And pen any penetrating or blunt force trauma to this area could dramatically increase the likelihood of a cardiac or injury to one of the great vessels. An open chest injury is the result of some type of penetrating chest wound, whether it's caused by a knife, gunshot, or a wide variety of other product pro objects such as ice picks, screwdrivers, letter openers, broken glass, nails, and even car keys. The issue with an open chest injury is it's pulling air into the thoracic ca cavity. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a noticeable sucking sound. This is referred to as a sucking chest wound. There's two problems in managing an open or sucking chest wound. One is preventing additional air from sucking into the chest cavity. The other is avoiding trapping the air already within the chest cavity. So what you do once you identify it is you want to cover it with your gloved hand and then apply some type of non-porous dressing such as an occlusive, dress, occlusive, uh, occlusive dressing and tape it on three sides. So here's your sucking chest, open chest wound. You want to take it, you would place your hand directly over it and then apply that occlusive dressing or some type of non-porous dressing and you can see it right here in the mediastinum. Now these open chest wounds can cause what's called a pneumothorax um, where the air is surrounding the lung and preventing it from being able to expand and bring air in. As this continues to progress it can develop into what's called a tension pneumothorax which we will be covering shortly. Close chest injury, this is due to some type of blunt force trauma. Uh, what happens with it is if it is of strong enough force, it can cause a large unstable flail segment where uh, two or more ribs are now fractured. What occurs with a flail chest segment is it's now interfering with proper expansion of the chest cavity, limiting intrathoracic pressure changes and leading to severe respiratory distress or inadequate respiration, thus causing rapid patient deterioration. Flail segment can cause what's called uh, paradoxical movement, where the flail segment is moving in a direction opposite to the movement of the rest of the chest wall. Now, for a flail chest segment to occur, two ribs that are next to each other have to be fractured in two or more places, basically where they are now free-floating within the thoracic cavity. So as you can see here, you have multiple ribs that are fractured. All of these are moving separately from the rest of the ribs. This section here is not. It would just be a broken rib.
when a person inhales, what's taking place, it's uh, making pressure inside the chest less than the pressure outside, thus causing air to draw in from outside the lungs. The pressure that draws air into the expanded chest also moves the flail segment inward. Exhalation takes place when the pressure inside the chest becomes greater than the pressure outside the chest, thus pushing air out of the lungs and decreasing the size of the chest. So when you go to inhale, you have that negative pressure, draws the flail segment in. During exhalation, you have that positive pressure change, and the flail segment is moving out versus in. When a patient has a flail segment, this requires immediate recognition and management. However, the underlying contusion of the lung is a possible more serious injury, resulting from the blunt force applied to the chest. The flail segment prevents the chest from generating a normal negative pressure necessary for inhalation. So you can have what, that pneumothorax to develop. Stabilization of the segment can reduce the paradoxical movement. However, it can also compromise other chest wall movement and lead to the collapse of more lung tissue and alveoli. Because lung contusion and lung collapse are associated with a flail segment, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP or positive pressure ventilation using a bag valve mask device with supplemental oxygen is the ideal treatment. If the patient is able to handle their own airway, have, you instruct them, don't take small breaths. You want them to take those full deep breaths. And if they start developing those signs of distress, place them on CPAP. The old treatment used to be placing a sandbag or an IV bag over the flail chest segment and securing it. That is no longer done um, because of the potential for causing further issues with breathing of the patient. Because now they're having to breathe uh, with this extreme weight on their chest. Pulmonary contusion, this is when there's some type of basically a bruise on the lung. Now the amount of respiratory distress that the patient has depends on the amount of damaged lung tissue. The patient may present with signs including dyspnea, cyanosis, as well as signs of blunt force trauma to the chest, such as bruising. What happens when somebody gets bruised? They bleed in that area. There's blood accumulating because of uh, capillaries being damaged. Same th premise occurs in the lungs. It starts bleeding around in that specific area, thus causing issues with the uh, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the interstitial space in the lungs. Emergency care of a patient with a pulmonary contusion is directed towards supportive ventilation and maximizing oxygenation by delivery of a high concentration of oxygen via non breather. If supplemental oxygen alone cannot improve or maintain adequate oxygenation in an alert and spontaneously breathing patient who is in respiratory distress, Using CPAP may improve oxygenation. Pneumothorax is that uh, condition that I keep referring back to where uh, you have a lung that is no longer able to uh, inflate properly. Signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax include chest pain that worsens with inspiration, dyspnea, tachypnea, and decreased or absent breath sounds on the affected side. A pneumothorax is primarily identified by a decrease or decretion, a decreased or absent breath sound from the side of the chest where the lung is partially or totally collapsed. If the patient with a pneumothorax is in a seated position, gravity can cause the air within the pleural space to move upward and decreased breath sounds are heard in the apex or top of the lung first. Causes of a pneumo may be caused by uh, penetrating trauma, Spontaneous pneumothorax or even a paper bag effect um, can occur because of due to sudden compression of the chest. Open pneumothorax is a th pneumothorax caused by some type of open chest wound. This is where you'll have that uh, um, sucking chest wound. Symptoms of an open pneumo are the same as for a closed pneumo except for an open wound to the chest. So 
So what's happening? You have that open chest wound. When the patient goes to breathe in, you have that negative pressure change. Not only is air coming into the lung, but you have air coming in through that injury as well. Thus putting more and more pressure on the chest. Tension pneumothorax, this is when you have some type of a shift in the, uh, what's called a mediastinal shift. These patients will have rapid deterioration, severe respiratory distress, um, and absent breath sounds to one side of the chest. Uh, should alert the EMT to a possible tension pneumo. Other signs and symptoms may include cyanosis, unequal movement of the chest, neck, uh, jugular vein distension, diminished breath sounds on the side opposite to the injury, as well as deviation of the trachea to the uninjured side. You'll also have a decrease in cardiac output. Because of the pre uh, pressure that the lungs place, as that pressure continues to move, so it's placing pressure on the on the heart, on the great vessels, um, not thus compressing on them and not allowing blood to flow properly. Now, a tension pneumothorax may also develop following application of an occlusive dressing to an open chest wound. Uh, to alleviate this condition or to alleviate the pressure. You want to lift the dressing slightly, thus allowing air to escape during expiration. Even if it's taped on only three sides, you want to lift this, okay? Hemothorax, this is when bleeding is occurring in and around the lung, in or around the lung, excuse me. These patients commonly will produce a pink or red frothy sputum when the patient coughs. Uh, care for hemothorax is the same as for pneumothorax and shock. Uh, this is, can be caused by blunt force trauma or due, due to penetrating, so you may have an open chest wound as well. Um, the patient will have absent breath sounds to one side, uh, flat neck veins, and also be presenting with signs of shock. Usually this is originating from a lacerated blood vessel within the chest wall or the chest cavity caused by that, uh, some type of penetrating object or a fractured rib. Traumatic asphyxia, this is caused by some type of sudden compression of the thorax. Um, so for example, uh, a, a giant a plank or a car uh, slamming into a patient's chest causing that sudden compression of the thorax. And what it does, it causes the blood flow to shoot out of the right ventricle back up into the upper body. So the patient may present with a bluish or purple discoloration of the face, head, neck, and shoulders. They may present with JVD or jugular vein distension, um, bloodshot eyes that could potentially be protruding from the socket due to the increase in pressure bleeding of the conjunctiva, as well as cyanosis and swollen tongue and lips. For patients that present with traumatic asphyxia, we want to provide this emergency care for any wounds to the chest and start treating for shock. Um, you also want to make sure that you have ALS on scene because they may have to do some procedures as well. Cardiac contusion. This is due to blunt force trauma due to some type of violent compression of the chest. This is basically a bruise to the heart. Signs and symptoms of cardiac contusion may include chest pain or chest discomfort. Signs of blunt trauma to the chest including bruises, swelling, crepitation or grating sensation, as well as deformity. Tachycardia and an irregular pulse may occur due to the disruption in the electrical conduction of the heart. Commotio cordis, this is when the patient presents in sudden cardiac arrest due to uh, blunt force trauma to the precordial area. An uh, example that I like to use is a baseball player, or excuse me, pitcher of a base, uh, throwing a line uh, pitch, batter hits it, line drives straight into the chest, pitcher goes down in cardiac arrest. 
They pres usually most common presentation will be ventricular fibrillation. Therefore, a pl application of an AED is important, and you'll start CPR per AHA guidelines. Uh, these patients may also present with a bruise to the center of the anterior chest wall where they were hit. Pericardial tamponade is when the actual, uh, you have bleeding into the sac that surrounds the heart. Um, what it's doing is causing compression of the ventricles and thus al not allowing the heart to be able to beat properly until, to the point that now it's no longer able to fill the ventricles. Usually this will develop in approximately 60 to 80 percent of stab wounds that the heart is affected. These patients will present with jugular vein distension, tachycardia, decreased blood pressure, uh, narrow pulse pressure, weak pulses, as well as what's called pulses paradoxus, or where the radial pulse diminishes upon inhalation. Emergency care focuses on early recognition and rapid transport while ensuring that you're able to maintain your airway and ventilation and ma maximizing oxygenation by delivering a high concentration of oxygen via an underbreather. Rib injury, this is caused due to uh, fractured rib um, due to some type of blunt force trauma. With each rib, you have an intercostal artery or vein that supplies the ribs. These can become lacerated because of the fracture and cause bleeding into the chest cavity and potentially cause a hemothorax. If a simple rib fracture is suspected, the patient usually will present in the guarded position, holding their arm over the injured side. You can use the arm to splint the injury by placing it over the injury site and applying a sling and swath to hold it in place. The patient may not be able to breathe deeply. They may be coughing and have tachypnea as well. Rib fractures are also less common in children than they are in adults because of the ribs being less uh, not as pliable. A patient who has a chest injury may appear relatively well at first, but can deteriorate suddenly and rapidly. The patient may not complain about a chest injury. In fact, in this scenario, the <coughs> uh, you're, you may have a patient that's complaining their only complaint is shortness of breath. However, it's your responsibility to suspect a potential chest injury based off of a, the mechanism of injury caught giving you a high index of suspicion. So make sure that if your uh, MOI indicates it, to make sure that you adequately assess your patient. When assessing the, a scene where chest trauma is suspected, make sure that you do a proper scene size up. Do not enter a scene of a, of a possible shooting or stabbing until PD has secured it and tells you that it is safe to enter. Make sure that you look over your scene size up. And remember that even though that the scene is, make, that the scene is cleared of, scene, of safety hazards, uh, concentrate on your mechanism of injury. Ask bystanders to tell you what happened and scan the scene. Look for your mechanisms such as sports accidents, gunshot, vehicle collision, explosion, or even a crush type injury. Go through your primary assessment. If a spine injury is suspected, take necessary spinal precautions. Inform your general impression of the patient. Do they appear cyanotic? Do they appear to be in extreme respiratory distress? Are they breathing shallow and rapid? Are they guarding their chest? Is their chest moving unevenly when they take their breath? Do they appear to be in distress, ra extreme respiratory distress? Are there any open chest wounds? If you suspect a pneumothorax, you do not want to use CPAP uh, because it can actually cause more pressure to occur within the lungs and, or inside the chest and cause worsening of the pneumothorax and develop it. Develop, develop into a tension pneumo. If they are breathing inadequately, po provide positive pressure ventilation. 
Hypertension pneumo, keep in mind, can result in increasing difficulty in ventilating your patient. So you may have to breathe a little bit uh, with more force. Make sure that you strip the patient of any clothing because this could disguise a life-threatening sucking wound or flail segment. If the MOI indicates possible chest injury or the patient shows any signs of respiratory distress, quickly expose the chest and examine it. Continue with your primary assessment and determine your patient's mental status. Altered mental status or unresponsiveness may be an indication of severe hypoxia resulting from a significant chest injury. Visually inspect the airway in the patient with altered mental status. Assess your pulse. If your patient has a weak rapid pulse and they have chest trauma, this could potentially indicate bleeding or compression of the heart. Go through your secondary assessment. Assess for subcutaneous emphysema or where air is uh, collecting underneath the tissue. And when you palpate the chest, it'll actually it'll feel um, like the bubble wrap that you will see sometimes in packaging. When assessing for tracheal deviation, you want to palpate the trachea immediately above the suprasternal notch or the indentation immediately above the sternum. Inspection of the trachea rarely reveals the deviation. However, palpation may allow you to feel the abnormal shift prior to seeing it. If you haven't done so already, you need to expose the chest at this point. Seal any open chest wounds that you may find. The buildup of pressure in attention pneumothorax can also cause the heart and large vessels to compress causing decreased blood flow to the heart and ineffective pumping, which produces signs and symptoms of shock. Jugular vein distension and tracheal deviation are late signs of a patient in, have, suffering from attention pneumothorax. Paradoxical movement of the chest indicates a flail segment. One of the major complications associated with a flail segment is the inability of the patient to generate pressure changes in the chest necessary to adequately move air into the chest cavity. If the patient is exhibiting signs and symptoms of a flail segment with evidence of inadequate breathing, ideal treatment is positive pressure ventilation. Also, you want to make sure that you're going through assessing for DCAP BTLS. Auscultate your lung sounds, making sure that you have bilateral breath sounds. And if the patient is alert, obtain your uh, medical history. If they are unresponsive or unable to answer your questions, consult with family or friends nearby. Go through and look for your signs and symptoms, such as dyspnea, tachypnea, bradypnea, hemoptysis, which is that bloody sputum, cyanosis, signs of shock, paradoxical movement, subcutaneous emphysema. And remember, not all of these signs need to be present to suspect serious chest injury. Sometimes the only signs that they may have is pain or slight breathing difficulty. Do they have any do they have pain at the site of injury? Failure of the chest to expand normally, or a drop in systolic blood pressure of less of more than ten millimeters on inhalation. If at any time signs of inadequate breathing appear, immediately begin positive pressure ventilation. Ventilation should be administered at a maximum of ten to twelve vent ventilations per minute and 12 to 20 breaths per minute in an infant. Make sure that you maintain your open airway and reevaluate breathing, stat re breathing status and avoid forceful ventilation. If an impaled object is found, do not remove it. Stabilize the object with bulky gauze and bandages to prevent excessive movement. The only exception to this is if the impaled object is impeding your ability to perform chest compressions in a pulseless patient or if the impaled object is impeding your ability to establish or maintain an open airway. Other than that, leave it alone. Increased respiratory distress, tachypnea, and severe de severely decreased or absent breath sounds on the injured side are indicators of attention pneumo. 
If an occlusive dressing has been applied and there are still signs of developing of a developing tension in the thorax, lift the dressing upon exhalation. With a flail segment, do not interfere do not splint in any way that will interfere with chest movement. Ensure that the patient is taking those full breaths. Consider CPAP. And if they are not breathing adequately, begin positive pressure ventilation. Remember, we no longer um, place the patient on the affected side or apply a sandbag or IV bag to the area like it used to be previously recommended. This can cause potential uh, imp impediment to the chest wall movement and increase the amount of alveolar collapse, thus worsening hypoxia. Make sure that you reassess appropriately. A decrease in blood pressure while an increase in heart rate, increasing respiratory rate and cyanosis, cool and moist skin may indicate a worsening chest injury or shock resulting from blood loss. Make sure that you do a full head to toe assessment when you reassess, that way you can look for any missed injuries. All right, guys, that concludes this uh, chapter. If you have any questions, please be sure to send them to me, either in Remind or in Blackboard, um, or write them down, and we can discuss it next time in class. Make sure that you're doing your Brady Labs. Y'all have a good rest of your day, and I'll see y'all next time.